Hello, and welcome back to Building Integrity. I'm your host, Josh Porter, and today we're going to be talking about the design of Champlain Tower South. We've conducted a full plan review, and we are going to have a lot of interesting things to talk about, and there's a lot to cover. This has taken me a long time to put this video together, so I hope you guys enjoy it, but please stick around because I think you guys are gonna be really surprised at some of the things we talk about and cover towards the end of this video. So let's just jump right into it, huh? All right, so the first thing you gotta think about when you are doing a forensic analysis of construction drawings is you have to take into consideration when the drawings were done, where did it come from, and these types of questions. So we call this a, a, a provenance, provenance review. And the first question you have to ask is where did it come from? Well, we know that these drawings we received from the town of Surfside. And this is important because sometimes when you're doing forensics, you might get them from the engineering firm by, uh, by a subpoena, or you might get them from the owners because they were given to them by the developer, right? So that's important to ask. The other thing is, are the drawings signed and sealed? Because if they're not signed and sealed, they really don't have any value as far as being considered final engineering documents. In this case, we know the drawings are signed. We can't see the seal, but that's because uh, in the 80s, in 79, when these drawings were engineered, they would have been uh, impressed or embossed with a, with a seal. And unless you run some graphite over that before you scan it in, you're not going to see that seal. Okay. Uh, the other thing, too, is you want to know what version of drawings are you working with. Okay. Um, are they the as-built drawings? Are they the ready-for-construction drawings? Are they one of the design sets? Um, in this case, we know that they were permit-ready signed and sealed drawings. We don't have as-built, as far as I'm aware. And at that point, they didn't really distinguish for a project like this ready for construction rather than design uh, drawings. So we know we have design drawings, we know they're signed, and we know they were submitted for permitting because, presumably, because they were given to us by the town of Surfside. Uh, and then the other question you got to ask yourself is once you're given all the drawings, you got to kind of sort them, organize them, and figure out, okay, are there any conflicts between the different drawings that I'm reviewing? Okay, so uh, talking about conflicts, uh, I went through all of the PDFs and I extracted out all of the structural drawings and then I sorted and organized them by date and everything else. You do proper forensic review on the drawings and this is what I've come up with. Uh, there are essentially five sets of structural drawings that were given to us by the town of Surfside. Two sets uh, were undated uh, and I show that up in this top left section of the image. Um, and that's pretty much what they look like. There's just no date, there's no rev date. Uh, sometimes they're missing uh, sheet numbers uh, of what they are. They are signed uh, by the engineer, um, but there's no date on them. So that, that was pretty strange. And then of course, out of that undated sets, there are two different building designs in those undated uh, drawings. Uh, then moving on, you have the drawings that were done in August 22nd of 1979. You can see that date here. We have nearly a full plan set of those drawings. And then out of those drawings, there were five drawings that were actually revised in January 17th, 1980. And those have a revision tag on them that look like this. And it has the date with the revision tag one. Now, the when you do this, you're supposed to tag the things in the drawing that you changed. And, and the engineer did do that, but he also made some very drastic changes to the drawings that he did not mark in this rev. And I think you'll find that very interesting. We'll get to that towards the end of the video. Uh, and then the last drawing set that was actually intermingled there was the Champlain Towers North drawing. And then uh, the other last drawing that we found was dated uh, towards the end of 1980. And this project, the, the construction of the project was already well underway. It had been being, it had been in the process of being built for several months. Uh, and then this drawing was issued, um, which is for the penthouse add-on. It's the structural framing drawing for that. Uh, one of the things that I find interesting, but I don't think it's, you know, a real big deal, but that this particular drawing has, uh, it's very hard to see the date, but I, I believe it's 11, 12, 1980. And uh, the sheet numbers don't appear to be an S series. It looks like it's 14A or something like that, right? Uh, but the other thing that's interesting is that it does not contain the engineer's uh, uh, company logo or anything like that, but it does appear to contain his signature. So, uh, like I said, it's just an interesting uh, point of interest. And talking about points of interest, we have a couple other points of interest that I found when I was reviewing the drawings. Uh, part of that revision change in uh, January of 1980 also included changing the pilings to a PIF uh, piles. And you can see that rev uh, tag one there. 
and uh, in the triangle. The other thing that I thought was interesting was that the planters out on the property are not actually built to any plan that I could find. Um, that, that maybe I missed it, but um, I, I went through the drawing several times and I couldn't find a drawing that actually matched the design of the planters. So if you look at the planters as they're built up in the uh, as they were built up in the top right here of this image, and I'm going to go ahead and make this a little bigger here. Uh, if you can see, if you see that configuration, then you see the planters as they're drawn on this on this uh, architectural sheet. You can see they don't match. Like the architectural sheet would have had uh, needed to show some extra planters here and an extra basin here, and this would have gone that way. That wouldn't have existed. And so you know, it, it it just the whole configuration is different. Well, the reason why this is important is because when you design the structure for the building, you want to design for the loads that are going to be imposed on it. Well, you know, if the engineer designed for a certain planter bed configuration uh, that looks like the the drawing, but then they built it a certain way, that would have caused different loading at different locations on the slab and beams below. Okay. Another point of interest, uh, just by going through all the drawings and figuring things out, is the limit on the 12-story limit for the building. Now, here is a, a district map for the city of Fort Myers Beach. I'm sorry, for uh, Miami Beach. I'm thinking I just was at Fort Myers today. Um, for the city of Miami Beach, and you can see at the very northern end of the district, it, it ends right at 87th Terrace. Okay, and if you look at where Champlain Tower South is located, okay, you can see I've labeled 87th Paris here on this image, and you can see uh, Champlain Tower South is uh, right here in the middle, and then you have 8701 Collins Ave Condominium on the left, and you can see it's quite a bit taller, and if you compare Champlain Towers South to Champlain Towers East, you can see that they're roughly the same height, right? So the town of Surfside at this time had a 12-story limit rule, and if you count the stories on Champlain Tower South, there's actually, if you count the penthouse, there's actually 13 stories. So that's, of course, a question for another day. But what, the reason why I'm bringing this up and why it's just a point of interest is because um, I wanted to talk a real quick about, you know, government regulation when it comes to construction and building. And this can be a double-edged sword. We need regulations and we need logical reg regulations, but a lot of times developers and, and, and just anybody really uh, will see these things as rules that, can, that are meant to be bent or meant to be broken, right? And so what, we wanna, uh, uh, what I wanted to point out is, is this 12-story limit rule, uh, not only did they somehow squeeze a penthouse on top of this, but in order to meet the regulatory rule, that's part of the reason why the garage was built so far underground, um, was because they were trying to get as many sellable floors as they could. Whereas if the rule wasn't there at all, they might have built a 14 or 15 story building, who knows, and the garage may not have been buried under the undergrade. So that's just an interesting uh, uh, takeaway from sometimes we have to think about the way these, these building regulations work is they tend to work as a double-edged sword. This also goes, uh, I'll have a quick commentary on the 40 year recertification process. In, in, in this this sort of affects the psychology of building owners because a lot of times building owners are like, well, I don't really have to do anything to this building uh, uh, because I'm it's only 35 years old. I haven't gotten close to the 40 years yet. And people say, oh, no, no, that never happens. Of course, you know, you, the, the certifi recertification program wasn't designed to let people wait until 40 years, but that's how regulations work. People tend to design to the minimum code and they tend to push to the maximum that a regulation allows. All right. So when I sat down to start examining the plans and started running calculations, uh, one of the things that you have to do when you're dealing with forensics is you have to, um, now there's two ways of doing this. You can analyze the drawings for the time in which they were designed using the codes under which they were designed. That's one purpose, which is the purpose I pursued in this uh, video. But then the second purpose that you can do is you can you can compare it to modern times. So you would compare Champlain Tower to South to modern codes, modern modern understanding of engineering. If let's say you wanted to retrofit the building and structurally upgrade it, but that wasn't the intent of my video here. My intent of the video was to analyze and see was it correctly designed in 1979, knowing what they knew then under the code that they had then. So uh, three things pop out. One. There would not have been really 3D modeling software to use in 1979, so all the calculations would have been done by hand. It would have had to have followed uh, ACI 318.77, which is referenced on the engineer's drawings, and he would have used the direct design method, which is simply a method of putting your formulas together for two-way slabs and such, 
and punching shear uh, when you do your hand calculations. All right, so let's start talking about the analysis of the plans in more detail. We know that there, were, there was a portion of the building that had 24 inch columns and a portion of the building that had 16 inch columns. And a lot of people were like, why did the other building stay standing? Oh, well, it's because it had 24 inch columns. But the reality is, is that it, it only had 24 inch columns for a couple floors. Now I highlighted in red here uh, in this image, the path, uh, one of the paths under the building that uh, vehicles would have taken at the lobby level, not at the garage level, but at the lobby level. And so because this is a vehicular path in this red area, you have to realize that you're going to have massive live loads. This isn't just a couple people walking along the slab, like, like as if they were going to the pool. These are heavy four, five, six thousand pound vehicles that are traversing up and down this red area. And so because of this massive live load, live loads are moving dynamic loads on a building as opposed to dead loads, which are just static. They just stay the same. Because you would have this high live load, you would have higher punching stresses, punching shear stresses around the columns. So the biggest, the best way that you can raise your capacity to handle punching shear is to increase your column size. And so I believe this is the main reason why these columns were made to be 24 inch columns. And the other reason why I think they did it this way was because if you look in this same portion of building at the second floor and above, they reduced those column sizes. So if you look at this image here, the areas that I have highlighted in red uh, is the larger 24 inch column at the lobby level below. But above that, you can see in the white squares that are kind of uh, half on, you know, partially over it. And then some of these columns are actually not over the column below at all. But if you look at those columns, those are much smaller. And in fact, the, it, the, 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 the uh, west side of the building was just the same as the east side of the building as far as from the second floor up. It was all skinny columns. All right. Uh, to show you a little bit more of that traffic path, here is the, the, the lobby level floor. This is just showing you quickly, you know, that you did have vehicular traffic going under the building. They would park this way, park that way. And you also had traffic that could come in off of this street and would travel underneath the building as well. So I think that uh, sort of explains those 24 inch columns. Now, the, the unintended benefit of the 24 inch columns is that once the progressive collapse occurred and it even overcame some of the slab punched through around these 24 inch columns. So here are some of your 24 inch columns. Okay, here's a 24 inch column. And I believe this is also another one at this lobby level. Now, it, that didn't prevent the slab from collapsing when it collapsed, it still punched through. But the difference is that I, wanna, I want you guys to note is that when this occurred, when this punch through occurred to the other side of the building, the building that did initially collapse, um, those columns being only 16 inch by 16 inch columns now went from having like a 10 or 11 foot uh, height to having a nearly 20 foot height. And now what you have is you have what's called a slender column. So it's very skinny, 16 by 16, and it's very tall. And those oftentimes will just simply buckle under their own weight. Well, the difference with this building is, is because the columns were 24 inch, even though they now have a span, a height span of about 20 feet, roughly, um, even though they have this higher span, height, they're super tall now, instead of being braced every floor, um, they, because of how big they are, they're actually, when you run the calculations, they're actually able to handle that height without buckling under the load. And so while people said, yes, the 24 inch columns is why the building didn't fall, uh, it was a combination with the shear wall, which we covered in a previous video, but the, the logic behind why the 24 inch columns mattered, uh, it was hopefully explained here now. All right, so the east wing columns. So the portion of the building that collapsed, which I have highlighted roughly here. Now I don't have it color coded anymore to distinguish which parts collapsed in what order. I'm just simply showing you roughly the area that collapsed and I've highlighted it in red here. Now the interesting thing is in this part of the building, there are two column, there's actually multiple column types, but there are two specific column types, columns C and D on the construction drawings that are actually over reinforced. They're specified to be over reinforced. And I'll get to that, uh, why, why that's important in a little bit. The uh, locations of those columns I've circled here, okay? Now, 
this is interesting, right? Because these are the, like, like for example, these lower three columns are the ones that we've always been talking about all along that, that would be where we would expect the initiation of collapse on the building portion, not of the whole property, but of the building portion, we would expect the initiation to occur somewhere around these three columns based on the collapse video of the building. Now, what does over-reinforcing the columns do? How are they re over-reinforced? Well, they're over-reinforced because the rebar that comes from below, from the floor below, has to tie up and lap with the rebar from above. So a lap is simply exactly what it sounds. It's where one bar is simply laying right next to another bar, and they might even wire tie those bars together, uh, but that's called a lap. And the length of the lap is called a lap splice, okay? And it might be 10 inches, 20 inches, whatever, okay? But that's the lap splice, and, and that's a form of splicing rebar together so that they work together. Well, where you have the rebar from the column below coming up into the column above, and it's lapping with each other in that zone area, you have excess rebar. Okay, so uh, and, and so why does the code not want us to put too much rebar in, in concrete? Well, there's a couple, one mode of failure, but, but, but more importantly, it's because when you have so much steel in the concrete, it can be hard to get the concrete to flow around all the steel and consolidate proper, properly. So you have concrete placement problems. Um, you can also have a decrease in shear capacity at column and slab connections because if you have excess steel it essentially creates like its own shear plane by not letting enough concrete interact between the slab and the column uh, you can also have concentrated compression loads uh, due to what's called plastic yielding so as the building ages and as concrete is under compression it will actually uh, uh, compress, we call it plastic yielding, but it will actually compress a little bit. And when it does that, if you've got end, rebar ends sticking up, it will create concentrated loads on those rebar ends, which can cause concrete cracking. And as we know, concrete cracking just basically accelerates the aging of the, of the building and can cause structural damage later on. The other thing that excess rebar does is it doesn't allow the concrete to shrink enough when it's curing, which can create a uh, cracking in the concrete by restricting that shrinking. Um, and then the last one, uh, or the last point that I wanted to point out uh, with this though, is that this problem of over reinforcement for these columns that I have circled here on this drawing, uh, it goes away after the third floor. So the engineer reduced the rebar from the third floor up, so this over reinforcement problem goes away. But where is it, where is it at a problem at? Again, our lower second floor, lobby floor, and garage level floor are over reinforced. All right. Next thing we're gonna talk about is the pool deck slab punching shear. We've done a whole video on punching shear before, but one of the things I wanted to point out is a lot of people I think keep referring to these and thinking of these particular columns that are supporting, that were supporting the uh, pool deck only as 16 inch columns, but in fact, they're even smaller than that. So if you go to the structural drawing sheet and you go to the uh, piling plan, and you look at where I've circled these columns. These are the columns uh, and, and pile caps for the columns that are supporting the pool deck only. And if you notice that they call all of these columns as column N, okay? Well, if you go over to the, uh, the um, column schedule on the structural drawings, and I have it highlighted here over on the bottom right, the end column is only a 12 inch by 16 inch column. And I actually went back into the garage walkthrough video and, and they're kind of far off in the distance from where the, the person recording the video was standing, but you can actually see that those are actually rectangular columns. They are 12 inch by 16 inch columns. So these are smaller columns. And why is that important? Well, the reason why that's important is because remember what I told you before about the 24 inch column and how it, it, it was, they were 24 inches for the cars in order to resist punching shear. You give a bigger column, you have a bigger uh, a, a cone, we call it, you know, shear cone around that column, but the smaller column is going to have a smaller. So it's sort of like, you know, what's easier? Is it easier to push your entire foot into the sand at the beach or is it easier to just simply take your finger and put it into the sand at the beach? So the narrower the column, the easier it is to punch through the slab. So these columns over at the pool deck were only 12 by 16 and they would have been more likely to punch through the deck. All right, uh, when I ran the calculation for that now, all right, so when I ran the calculation for the punching shear around these 12 inch by 16 inch columns, I found that the, uh, that the slab was actually right at 100% load for punching shear just due to the dead weight alone. 
Now, fortunately, over the last 40 years, I would highly doubt that they had some massive party out at the pool deck that would have maximally loaded the pool deck with live load. This would have required, you know, people standing almost shoulder to shoulder in order to maximally load um, the deck with live load. So most of what we're concerned about is dead load. And yes, even though it's maximally loaded at 100% dead load for punching shear, that doesn't mean it's going to punch through. What it means is it will start fatiguing and cracking. Uh, but then it also means that there's, there is some, re even though I've stripped away all the factors of safety when I when I ran these calculations, you wouldn't do that when designing the building, but you would do this sometimes when analyzing the building to say, well, could this make it fall down? So I stripped away all the factors of safety. We're at 100% loaded. Uh, but yes, it can sit there at 100% loaded for 40 years uh, until the corrosion damage catches up to it and it reduces the capacity of the slab. Then, then you would have a, a problem. All right. Sticking with the pool deck, the other thing I found when running the calculations on the pool deck, and, and I've highlighted this note here, is that the, the pool deck area, actually all the slab areas, are specified to have bottom reinforcement of number fours at 12 inches on center uh, each way, in, a, in addition to any indicated bottom steel. Well, for most of the pool deck, there really isn't any additional bottom steel, so it's really, this is your mat that you're working with for bottom steel. Now, one of the things I found when running my calculations is that for flexure, in other words, for just simply loading the deck, with dead load, a nine and a half inch deck with number fours of 12 inches on center and using the direct design method that the engineers should have used in 1979, 1980, I find that the slab between some of the columns out at the pool deck, not all the columns, but at some of the critical sections out at the pool deck is actually 100% loaded again. I mean, I couldn't believe the math literally came out like right at 99.9% .9 loaded with dead load. So again, you have this situation where you have something that's maximally loaded. It can exist that way for decade after decade after decade, but eventually if it takes too much damage due to corrosion or whatever, and its capacity is reduced, because again, I'm running these calculations based on original capacity in 1980, if the concrete was fresh and the steel was not corroded. So you corrode these things and you damage the concrete, your capacity drops, and then your load becomes more than 100%. It becomes 110 or 120%. All right. The um, other thing that I found <laughs> with the slab is that this reinforcement, the number fours at 12 inches on center, if you use the ACI 31877 code book, is under reinforced for temperature steel. Okay, and now temperature steel is the amount of steel you're supposed to put into a slab in order to resist thermal expansion and contraction, mostly thermal contraction at night, um, because every night when concrete cools down, uh, from the day so it warms up during the day it absorbs heat absorbs radiant energy and it actually will expand and then at night it will cool down and when it cools down in order to prevent the concrete from completely cracking apart and causing more which will obviously cause more problems later on by letting too much water in and everything else you're supposed to put enough reinforcement in there to counteract that but these number fours at 12 inches on center are not adequate to achieve that goal the other thing i found <laughs> with his design is that um, according to the ACI 31877 code, okay, at all sections where required, reinforcement for shrinkage and temperature, so we just talked about the temperature rebar, right, temperature and shrinkage rebar, uh, shall develop the specified yield strength, okay, in, in tension in accordance with section whatever. All right, so the goal is that all sections that it is it is required to do this. Well, this is what the code says, and sometimes codes can be confusing. So what ACI has been doing for decades and decades and decades is they've been issuing a, a, a companion book to the code book, which they call the commentary. And so if you look at the commentary section and you look at the same, same section in the code, 7.12.4, you'll see that they're talking about splices. And if you remember, I talked about splices is where you have one rebar and then you have an overlap of another rebar, and that's called a lap splice and they're saying splices and end anchorages of shrinkage and temperature reinforcement must be designed for the full specified yield strength well when i calculated what that would have been for the number fours using the method in aci 31877 i came up with a minimum lap required of 20 inches for all of this rebar in the slab specifically if it's going to be useful for temperature reinforcement. The engineer didn't make any other calculate or any other provisions for temperature rebar. So I'm, I think most engineers would reasonably assume that the number four is at 12 inches on center, even though those are for negative moments, would also be used for your temperature steel. All right, but if you look at his details where he has this bottom steel overlapping, 
you can see that he has only a three inch and a three inch overlap, which is only a six inch lap. Now for structural purposes, this bottom steel, we don't really need it to, to fully lap at this location over the column line. So this is your column strip here. And then this is your middle strip. We don't really need the rebar to do this, except when it's acting as temperature steel. And when it's acting as temperature steel, you have to follow the code and you have to have a 20 inch lap. So I thought that was interesting. That's not going to make the building fall down or make the slab fall down. What it's going to do is it could allow excess cracking to occur early in the structure's life, which accelerates the aging process by letting water get deeper in and chlorides and carbon dioxide get deeper into the concrete, causing it to age at an accelerated rate. All right. Now here's the most interesting thing coming up that uh, that I think just really kind of drives everything home for this design and why I believe this design um, was sort of doomed to begin with uh, from, from, the, from the inception of the building, or I should say from the construction of the building. On the left, you have the way the pool deck area and parking was designed uh, in August 22nd, 1979. And I will, I will uh, make this bigger in a second. The, on the right, you have um, the revision that the engineer made in January 17th, 1980. So what you're looking at on the left, if you see the area that I've shaded green, this is the parking area at the lobby level, okay? And what I have shaded in red are the beams that were under this area. Well, why did they have beams? Well, because the parking area, so this is like the parking and, and drive, oops, parking and drive area. All right. And then this is the pool deck area over here. Well, between these two areas, they had a, they originally designed this with a one foot step down. And so I'll kind of draw that over here because that's pretty small. Uh, essentially what they wanted was they wanted this to, they wanted the parking area to step down one foot or 12 inches to the pool deck. And so in order to achieve that drop down, you would need what they what they what he had designed as a slab drop detail. But it's really what it is, it's a beam. Okay. Now we know from that, from this drawing here, that they wanted a 12 inch, okay, 12 inch step down. So this thing said this note here says varies, but we know at this location it would have been 12 inches. So in this case, you would have ended up with a 21, I believe, and a half inch uh, beam by 12 inch beam. So here's your here's your width of your beam. And we know it's a beam because he specifies all the reinforcement that he wants in that thing. So these step downs were to act as structural beams to span between columns. Uh, these are big beams, 21 and a half by 12 is not a small beam. Okay, it has stirrups and it has top and bottom rebar. He also had another beam specified out at the property, which are the beam type A's. Okay, and these are like integrated slab beams. So there's not a step down here at the beam A, but there is uh, there does need to be a beam there in order to transfer loads. So for example, uh, if you look at this beam here, this step up uh, step down beam, you'll notice that it doesn't sit on top of the column. And so what they did was they designed this beam to actually extend over to the column and pick it up. So it's a transfer beam, the beam A's. Well, if you look at this detail on the right, you can see the beam type A, all right? And it was supposed to be 12 inches wide, uh, and then it's supposed to have a five and a half inch drop from the slab. So that would be what, a 15 inch beam. So 15 inch by 12 inch beam, and of course it has a lot of reinforcement, stirrups, and everything else. So it was definitely designed to be a structural beam integral to the build. So here we got a clean drawing, and we got our, 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 our beam type A, and we have another transfer beam type A here. And then the rest of the beams that are highlighted in red are um, your, your step up and step down beams, or really your step down beams from the parking area. And again, this is your parking, and this is your pool area. Now, we've been looking at the left side of this drawing, the 1979 drawing. Now, in, in the 1980, January of 1980, presumably the architect wanted to get rid of the step down. He wanted to eliminate this one foot step down. And so in eliminating that one foot step down, the engineer eliminated the integrated beam. He eliminated this beam here. 
And then because he didn't need these, these beams anymore, he ended up eliminating the beam type A over here. And so now you can see on the right side, if you look at the right side of this drawing, uh, of these drawings, or of this image, I should say, you can see that we have all the same columns, but now we don't have, you know, that beam type A anymore. We don't have the, the step up and step down beam. It's just, it's gone. I mean, it just doesn't exist anymore. This is just plate slab construction again. All right. Now, when you look over at the, um, the, the lobby, so if you are standing here, let's see, I'm going to get my bearings here. All right. So if you're standing here and you are looking in this direction and you are down in the parking garage, you will see this other step down. Okay. This is from the building to the parking deck. All right. So from the building to the parking deck, you are going to be stepping down about uh, one foot six inches. So this is an 18 inch step down. All right. And if you're it's standing in this park in inside the parking garage and you look up, you should be able to see that 18 inch ledge. Well, if we go back to the garage walkthrough video, we can see standing in that exact location where she was at the time and looking up, you can see how the ceiling steps up. 18 inches. All right. So this we, we can correlate what we're seeing in the drawings with this video to kind of determine roughly an as built configuration. I mean, we, we don't know what kind of steels in there, obviously, but we know there's there's this 18 inch step that we would have found here is is repeated and, and is visible here in this image. OK, <clears throat> now, if you move uh, further down the the garage okay and and later in her video she is standing roughly here and she is looking i'll make that bigger for you she's looking this direction roughly right and and if you're standing in the garage and you're looking that direction you should see this beam a coming off of that column beam type a if it was built there right if it was built you would see that okay but when we go and we look at the video, and I want you to pay attention to one thing real quick so you can get your bearings in this next image. Look at this column here and look at this column here. And I want you to notice how they're not in line with each other. Okay. Now I've gone through the video several times, so I know exactly where she's standing at this particular moment. But if you look at the video and you notice, again, like I said, these, these columns are, are out of line with each other. They're not, they're not in, in line with each other. And so if you look at this column, you can see that this column here is located here and this column here is located there. And you can tell that these are not in line with each other, these columns, right? So we're looking at the same two columns. Now, we would expect to see we would expect to see beam A sticking down five and a half inches, and it should be as clear as day as, as this step down. Now, it would be shorter, it wouldn't be 18 inches, right? It would be five and a half, but we would expect to see it. And if you come and you look at this image, you see no beam. And it's not, you know, I don't believe it's an optical illusion. I've gone back and, and looked at this video and played it forward, backward, frame by frame, at real speed, double speed, you know, anything that can get your eye to focus on that ceiling and I just do not see that beam type A. So that leads me to believe that the building was indeed built as it is shown on the 1980 drawn. We don't have any of these beams. We don't have beam A is not there. We don't have this step down beam. That's not there. We don't have these step down beams. And we don't have this beam A. I don't believe we have any of these these things. Now they may exist, but I haven't I haven't found them yet. I haven't seen them. So what is the implications of this? Well, the thing is, is that at some point in 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 1980, in, around January, when this revision was done, somebody communicated to the engineer that they wanted to get rid of the one foot step. So he did that, and then somebody in his firms or, or himself said, "Well, we don't need all these extra beams then." But the problem is, is that those beams served a second secondary purpose. And that I think is what is really missing in this, this design here is this understanding of what the secondary purpose was of these beams. Well, let's look at the planter boxes for the rest of the building. 
It just so happens, and I highlighted all of these beams in A, uh, beams in red, sorry. It just so happens that everywhere else on the building where there's planter boxes, all around the building, everywhere else where there's planter boxes, there are beams below the planter boxes. So here I highlighted in red an array of beams over towards the uh, east side of the uh, building. And you can see that this is generally where all of those planter boxes came out and are built around the building, okay? And you got planters here and they come across, whatever. They do whatever, whatever shape they have, but they're over these beams. So these beams are there to support these planters. And they're really, yes, they're there to pick up some other loads. You could argue, well, they're here to pick up these, uh, these wall loads that are not over the columns. That's true, these are transfer beams. Again, you have beam type A, beam type A, you have these transfer beams to pick up these loads. But over here, you don't really have that argument. These, these beams appear to me to be generally there for some slab changes, uh, slab height changes, and to pick up the load from those, from those planter boxes. But when the engineer made the change to the drawings, we ended up with this configuration where we have planters, which are in yellow. And these things are not light. I mean, these things fill up with water. They've got full of dirt, plants, and then they have a concrete wall built around them on all four sides. So you've got these big, heavy planters. And then you've got these vehicles here. Now, before... Between this column and this column, we had a beam. So any load from the, the, I mean, the beam goes on, but just showing you just this one location. So that means between any load from the planters or this car right here would have been transferred over to that beam. And that beam was very stout and would have transferred the load as compressive loads to these columns, okay? Now, the problem is, is that when he got rid of the beams, nobody changed the parking layout and nobody changed the planter box design. So all of this weight continued to go there. Now, remember what I told you at the beginning of the video? The 24 inch columns, in my opinion, were there to handle the extra punching shear from the vehicles. Well, you've got 24 inch columns here, you've got it here, you've got it here. Now you didn't need it you didn't need 24 inch columns over here and over here and over here before because you had those beams. But now without those beams, you've literally got a vehicle sitting right next to a 12 inch by 16 inch spindly little column. Not only is that column spindly, but we've already talked about how the slab is overloaded. And that slab is overloaded, by the way, without considering vehicular loads and without considering these planter box loads. So now you've got this area of the slab that we're looking at here that is significantly overloaded now. Now we're not talking about 100% loaded, we're talking about overloaded. It's got planter boxes, it's got vehicles, and you've got these spindly 12 by 16 inch columns with no, um, with no beams or anything to transfer these loads. And I think that this of all things is probably um, one of, to me, when I, when I, when I calculate and I structurally analyze the building, I think to myself, um, of all the places that are overloaded, this is the one place that is, that is maximally overloaded. And if you go back and you think about, uh, some of the eyewitness reports and some of the survivors of the collapse and phone calls from the collapse, several people mentioned the cars having collapsed or the parking area collapsing with the pool deck or some people mentioned the parking area collapsing prior to the pool deck and until i had done the structural analysis of the drawings i didn't i didn't think that was a bad idea i just didn't i just didn't i didn't have the opportunity to follow up on that but now that's beginning to make a lot of sense that people are saying that perhaps the initiation the location the loci of where this all started was around here and then everything radiates out from there. And you can get a better visual of, the, uh, of these planters by looking again back at this image. And when you come back and you look at this image and you realize that there's no beam underneath this between these, these columns, okay? And you've got all this weight of all these planter boxes 
and no beams underneath them, nothing to take the weight of them. And you've got, you've got these cars here. You've got this car and you've got this car literally parked within a foot or two of these tiny spindly 12 by 16 columns. I think this was, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised that it took 40 years for this thing to collapse. Um, but I, I believe that, that when NIST finishes their investigation, I think a lot of the analysis is going to point to this location being the initial area that collapsed and the uh, and and then everything and how it progressed from there on out will of course still be up for debate and for um, for analysis in the future. But I've already kind of talked about how the 16 inch columns weren't going to put up much of a fight towards the building and the problems that would follow from that. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hopefully you guys learned something. Um, I really think at this point, you know, now that, now that the design analysis is done, I'm feeling a little bit um, better about my understanding of really what initiated and what caused this collapse. And hopefully this has helped you too. Thanks and take care.